James chapter 1. Look with me in verses 1 through 4 as we're going to start a preview or an overview rather of the book of James. James is right after the book of Hebrews, tucked in right there. James is writing in verse 1, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Father, I ask you to guide us into all truth this morning. Lord, I ask you now just to just to take control of my thoughts, my words. Lord, we've done all the studying, but we want to go in the direction you want us to go. We want you to speak to our hearts through your word this morning. So, Father, I pray against any distractions or disruptions that would keep each one of us, Lord, hearing from you, quiet our thoughts, still our hearts. We're here to listen. And it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. And everyone said together, the Bible is the most important book ever written because it's different than any other book. We all know that, don't we? We don't have to be convinced of that. It's not an, just an inspired book like some great novel. It's actually inspired by the Holy Spirit. So it has all the things we need in this life. You know, the Old Testament as we made our way up to James, um, we started in the Old Testament just kind of doing a survey through it. This is the creation of man and science backs, observation of science backs that up. The archaeological evidence backs it up. The fossil record back up the, that we were created. And then there was this fall. And that's when brokenness came into our world. That's when evil came into our world. If you look around and you're wondering, why can't we just all get along? Why can't man, I mean, I thought the United Na uh, Nations was to bring all the countries together. The reason why it's not happening and it won't happen until Jesus Christ comes back is because we live in a broken and undone world. And there's evil in this world. People do evil things. And that's because sin was introduced. I, I shared this with the first service. I had no intention of doing it, but I want to share it with the second service. Um, pa Mike Pompeo, do you guys know Mike Pompeo? He's a believer. I don't know if you know that. He graduated in the top of his class at West Point, and um, he's, a, he's a believer. He's a Christian. And they just came out with a report this last week that America leads the world in sex trafficking. Yeah, I would have never, ever believed that 20, 30 years ago, ever. I would have said, not in America. And they're talking about these children. This is where this brokenness is, is happening as our nation is turning away from God. And so I, I want to make a statement because I, I think it's important for me to make this statement. And I'm not speaking on behalf of Calvary Chapel. I'm not even pretending I'm speaking on behalf of God. I'm just going to give you my opinion. Is that okay? And you can completely disagree with me. If you are convicted of child sex trafficking, death penalty, period. I'll lead them to the Lord. I'll go witness to them and try to lead them to the Lord. But I tell you what, if you've never sat down with someone who's been sexually abused, come into my office sometime. So these sexual abuse victims, their lives are stolen from them. Things that they'll never get back. So brokenness came into this world. We were created in brokenness because of sin. And then there was this promise right after the fall happened that there's one who's going to come and undo the power of sin, undo the power of the God of this world, who's Lucifer, who has taken one third of the angels with demon angels with him. Now that the demonic realm is all around us in the spiritual realm, it's evil. It's very real. And Jesus was going to come as a fulfillment of all these prophecies. That's what the Old Testament is all about: this coming Messiah. The New Testament, the Gospels, are Jesus coming and proclaiming. The kingdom of God is here. There's only two kingdoms in this world. There's a kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. And, and you know, you when you travel, we got five teams, I think, going back to Africa, another team going to the DR, um, Dominican Republic at the end of this month. 
And, and if, when you travel and you meet other Christians, even though they don't speak the same language, you know you're part of the same kingdom. It, you just, it's just this connection that happens. They're believers. Wow. And, even though, and you can just look at each other and you're saved and you understand grace. You understand how much God loves you. It's just, it's just there. It's palpable. So Jesus comes, declares the kingdom of God is here. The only way into the kingdom of God, Jesus said, is me. I'm the door. I'm the way, the truth, and the lies. No man comes to the Father but through me. Not Muhammad, not Buddha, not Confucius, no one else. Then the book of Acts is the establishment of the church. It's you and me. For the last 2,000 years, the church has been spreading and growing. And the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us. We become the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament temple, no longer needed for animal sacrifices. Even though as part of prophecy, they're going to rebuild a third temple in Jerusalem and start sacrifices again. But that's prophecy. So that's the book of Acts. Then we get into Romans, which is just the depth of the gospel. If you want to understand the struggle that goes on within each one of us between flesh and spirit, man, that just nails it. Then we get to 1 and 2 Corinthians. Man, that's the church. And church and ministry is messy. See, we don't want to come into church pretending something that we're not. We don't want to come in not pretending that we struggle with things. We, we, we want to come into church learning the truth of who God says we are, right? We want to grow in that. But if we're struggling with something and everyone struggles with something, we want to be able to be transparent about that. Because I, I tell you what, there, there's just no freedom unless I am willing to confront things that I'm struggling with in my life and, and get my brothers or you sisters, get your sisters alongside of you. And First and Second Corinthians, my goodness, what a dysfunctional people. But do you know fun is in dysfunctional? So you can come together and Paul writes these people who are coming out of the gay lifestyle, coming out of prostitution, coming out of all kinds of stuff, and he's just telling them, hey, listen, you're saints, you've been forgiven, but we got to give you some practical instruction on how to live this Christian life. I love that. Then it gets into Galatians, the fight for grace. It's grace plus nothing. Because the Judaizers were coming in and trying to say, no, you need to keep some of the law. Then you go to Ephesians, our citizenship, or not our citizenship, who we are in Christ, our identity. Then you get into Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven. Then you get to Colossians, who is Jesus, goes into depth of who Jesus is. Then you get into First and Second Thessalonians. Talks about the man of sin, who is the Antichrist, and the rapture of the church. The man of sin who's going to sign a peace treaty in the Middle East. We learned this from Daniel. And where are they trying to find a peace treaty so desperately nowadays? In the Middle East. And now Jared Kirchner has now come out. Interestingly enough, he's been working on this peace deal in the Middle East. Jared Kirchner is President Trump's son-in-law. He's Jewish. And he's been working behind the scenes. Interestingly enough, Saudi Arabia just this last week came out and said... This is a pathway for us. This is a Muslim country. This is a pathway for us to have peace with Israel. I'm like going, oh my gosh. And if you know prophecy, that is really, really important. So the man of sin and the rapture. They're getting to 1 and 2 Timothy. And 1 and 2 Timothy is a time is coming. The theme is a time is coming when the church will not endure sound doctrine when the church themselves will throw up or heap up teachers that will tickle their ears. In other words, tell them what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. I tell you right now, church in America, we live in that time. We live in a time when when Jesus is more of a self-help guru than he is Lord and Savior. And that is such a huge mistake. It's this subtle thing that's just crept into the church, and it's popular Always be a little suspicious of those things that are popular with our culture. Just be suspicious of it. Because what happens is the gospel always calls you and me and calls men to make a decision. And this decision is this, come and die. (laughs) Come and die, what are you talking about? Come and die and, and give your life to me, give your life and your will away to me. Jesus says, and you'll find your life. But if you hold on to it, you'll lose it. No, that's not a popular message. I don't know if you've been following our culture. Then we got into uh, Titus, and that is how do we live in this world? 
and then Philemon. And Philemon is this. For a disciple of Jesus Christ, forgiveness is not an option. If someone hurts me, someone's hurt me from my past, you know, something from my childhood, something horrible happened, or, or a brother or sister I feel like has snubbed me, and, and it can be, bitterness can begin to set in, where it's made clear that we are, for a disciple of Jesus, forgiveness is not an option. Then we got into Hebrews, which we just finished up last week. And Hebrews' theme is Jesus is better than anything. Aaron, Moses, Abraham, any angels, Jesus is better than. Now we get into James, the book of James. And the theme of the book of James is we must act according to our faith. If we say we have faith, then we act according to it, which is such a simple message. I, I will act upon what I really and truly believe. Does that make sense? Let's get into God's word. Verse 1, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, here it comes, this is for you and me. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. As a younger Christian, I used to look at verse 2 and kind of chuckle. Like, I'm supposed to con consider it all joy when I fall into various trials. Listen, look at that word trials in the Greek, the original language it's written in, means proving. So in other words, things are gonna, God's going to allow things in my life that are going to prove what's really there. And how does He do that? He allows trials. But I'm supposed to consider it all joy when I encounter various... How many out there really love tests and trials? I mean, you're driving down I-70, you get that dun 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 Oh, I got a flat tire. Praise, thank you, Lord. With a flat tire. I was really looking forward to that today. Well, here, here, here's the deal. Here is what God is after. For you and me to gain an eternal perspective. You see, it's the, God's design, sending Jesus the Messiah and the, the message of the Bible, watch this, is to take us back, if you will, take us back to what we were created to be. And that is in full fellowship with Him, fully accepted, fully loved, understanding grace. And He is our God and, and fellowshipping face to face. The whole idea is to take us back. So what happens is, in this life, I become dependent upon other things. And so what the Lord is doing is He's working in my life is He'll allow tests and trials in my life to take me back and us back to depending upon Him. And nothing does that better than having my world shaken. Because I don't know about you, but I am a master at becoming comfortable. I'm a master at just, well, I'm good. Give me my lazy boy Christian chair. You know, I'm okay, just sleep. But God's not interested in that. He's interested in taking me to a different place of dependence. Does that make sense? And unfortunately, the only way that happens is if my... I get tested. Now watch what he says here. My brother encountered all joy when you fall into various provings, knowing that that testing of your faith produces patience. That word patience means endurance. That testing produces endurance. But let patience have this perfect work that you may be perfect, complete, and lacking nothing. So this idea of lacking nothing, go with me on this. this what is God after when he says lacking nothing? Most of us think of, I'm not lacking anything. If I got a house, I got a really nice bank account. I'm happy in my marriage. All my kids are walking with the Lord. That's, no, that's not. What James is saying is he wants us to grow into complete dependence upon him through tests and trials, which produces patience. Now, I think of myself as a younger Christian, and I was so incredibly impatient with trials. And I still am a lot of times. I was just like, really, God? Can't we just get this off the, my plate? Do I have to deal with this situation, or do I have to deal with myself? Can anybody relate to that one? These tests and trials come. Well, now that I'm hopefully growing, <laughs> 
You know what happens with tests and trials? I never thought I would say these words, but it's becoming true. Tests and trials are becoming an old friend. I still don't like them. But what it's doing now is it's pushing me more into an eternal perspective. I see things more in eternal perspective. And I, 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 I think at the age of 59, I'm beginning to see the finish line. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I want to finish well. I want to finish so well. Jenny Saunders, um, Tuesday, when I visited her early in the morning, then I brought my grandson back. She wanted to see JJ because she's heard about JJ, but she's never met him. And, and so we're in this crowded room, and, and uh, Jenny is in and out of consciousness. And, and I'm going to tell you exactly what she said and the way she said it. Pastor, yes, Jenny, I saw you and Sharon. The most beautiful field of flowers holding a little boy's hand and Jesus was there can you hear me in the back and I saw you and Sharice holding hands and a little boy and the flowers were so beautiful and Jesus was there and I was there too <laughs> And she looked at me with these pleading eyes like, do you believe me that I was there? I said, oh, Jenny, I do believe you because when saints are getting ready to step into eternity, it's not unusual for the Lord to give them these glimpses of eternity. It's not the first time we've heard this. But now when she said, I saw you and Sharice holding hands, well, I'm like, that's cool, so we get to hold hands in heaven. All right. I mean, Sharice is my best friend. Let, let's talk about this for a second. Sharice is my best friend. And isn't your spouse your best friend? So in heaven, why wouldn't you hang with your spouse? And your kids, they have a special place. Why don't you hang with them? It's not that we're going to have more kids in heaven, no. But, but why wouldn't the family unit come and come back together? Why not? So, so we're there, and then the little boy. Now, when she said the little boy, everyone is everyone in the room, so there's probably 12 her family members in the room. And I looked up and I said, that would have been Jacob, our son, who died at a week old. And the whole room went, oh. But if that's the end game, if that's the end game, heaven, where we're going to be, now you understand why James says, count it all joy when we encounter these things that are pushing us more towards reality, more towards the re eternal reality. We mentioned this last week. But if Jesus is all we're going to need when we step into eternity, why isn't he all we need right now? So I want my dependence to begin to continue to grow. You know, I don't recommend this for anyone, but do you know that the loss of a child, and some of you have lost your children, you understand that pain. You, you get that. That was the most painful thing we've been through. But can I say something that may not even make any sense? It's also the greatest blessing. It's, I, I know that sounds like you're crazy, Pastor, and my only response to that is you finally figured that out. But no, and the reality is that God uses this stuff to, to, to give us a different perspective. So that's what James is saying. And then in verse 5, he says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let, him, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So in verse 5, if I lack wisdom, now what is wisdom? He says we're to ask of God. And it's interesting. Through the years, I've always defined wisdom as, and I think it's a fairly good definition, but I've always defined wisdom as, or we've always defined wisdom as what to do and when to do it. So it's not only what to do, but when to do it, because you can know what to do, and if it's not the right timing, it messes it up, right? And if you can know when to do something, but if it's wrong, it still messes things up. But you know what? Went back into the original word for wisdom in the Greek language, and it just kept going down because there's layers of the Greek language, kept going down, down, down. You know what it, you know how you can interpret this? Wisdom. 
God's intelligence. Think about that. Does anybody want God's intelligence? This is amazing stuff. God, what do I do in this situation? And, and there's what God says is, listen, if you ask, I'm going to answer. If you ask what to do in this situation, I'm going to absolutely answer that question. But the thing is, you have to add, ask by faith. Because he's going, to add, he's going to answer. And the crazy thing about faith is, is when you come to God and say, God, what should I do in this situation? First of all, you've got to believe he's going to answer. Second of all, you've got to be willing to obey. Now, I've been on both sides of the fence many times. God told me what to do. I'm like, I'm not doing that. No, I don't think that's a good idea. God said, well, you asked. I want to share a, a couple of stories with you. First one was, I, I, I was uh, this is 26 years ago, and, and they were, we had a men's deal, and um, someone misinterpreted something I did, and they wanted to come talk to me. And they told me what it was, and I, I talked to three other brothers. I said, is that, how, is that what I did? They said, no. They said this person gets something in their mind. They kind of chew on it, and, and they're, they're just, they're just, they talked to me, us about it already. We even told them, no, that's not what Wes was doing. Anyways, the long story short was he was going to come talk to me and correct me. So I'm, I asked for wisdom. You know, what, you, know what, you know what the wisdom came back? I thought the Lord was going to go, yeah, flatten that dude verbally. Correct him. Just tell him three other guys. Say, you know what the Lord said? He said, apologize. I'm going, oh, oh, oh God. wrong frequency. I'm not quite here. I didn't, didn't, la, 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 didn't hear that. Well, la, 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 apologize. And it was so clear he was telling me to do this. It's unmistakable. I'm going, okay. <laughs> Comes over and he says, you know, blah, 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 blah. just acting a little irritated. I go, okay, I, you know, I'm sorry. Well, you know, usually if someone says sorry, just just pull the reins a little bit to check your horse because they're saying they're sorry. This guy charged. And I was just and he kept doing it. I'm, I'm sitting there just going, so can I get another wisdom info right here? <laughs> and the Lord said, You still apologize. And so I did. I'm, like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Do you know there has been dozens of times of the last 25 years I've seen this person and the thought came to me, I'm gonna go tell him with the truth. And the Lord's like, no, no. Because the only thing that's happening right now, Wes, is your pride. That's all that's happening. And he can, so when we ask for wisdom, another thing, and I share this story with caution. This is the story I share with caution. Well, I was pre-med for for first two years in college and and was you know I was going to follow my sister and become a physician and I know that's scary for some of you to think about but anyways um, so I was I was getting ready now you remember me asked for wisdom I was getting ready for my organic chemistry uh, final and um, and I'm studying the night before the final and the Lord speaks to my heart don't go to the final I'm like, oh my God, what, what? I'm 19 years old. What? And it, he impresses it. So I said, Lord, you need to give me wisdom. I need to know what to do. Speaks to my heart. Don't go to the final. So I kneel down on my, at my bed. And I say, Lord, I, I'm a 19 years old, really young in my faith. I accept the Lord at the age of 16. I'm now 19. I'm kind of like, Lord, I just I sense you telling me this. What's going on? Now, I'm going to tell you exactly what's happened. Is this a deal? This isn't exaggerate, exaggerate the story, give God the glory stuff. This is exactly what happened. I knelt down. I said, Jesus, you've got to give me a sign because walking away from a final, that's madness. I tell you the truth. I felt a hand touch me on my shoulder. Then I went to my sister, who's a Christian. I said, this is madness, Jenny. I said, I, said, I feel like the Lord's telling me. She looked at me. She says, I, I sense it too. So I didn't go to my final. You get an F when you don't show up for a final. And that destroys your GPA. Destroys it. Which means medical school. Yikes. So about two months later, I'm working at Jack in the Box. I'm climbing the ladder of success. And guess who walks in? My professor. And I'm back there, woo, woo, woo. And she goes, oh, Wes, Wes, Wes. I'm like, what? <laughs> I know. She says, hey, 
you know what, you had a B plus in the class and you were doing really well. I just want you to know I gave you an incomplete. You don't give incompletes. Incomplete means it doesn't count. It's just, it's like you take the class and it doesn't affect your GPA. So now fast forward a year and a half later. God has changed my heart. I don't want to live in a mansion, drive a BMW and have a trophy wife. Well, I got the trophy wife. But anyways, I, you know, I don't want to be this rich physician. And, and now I'm, I've changed my major. I'm at Viola University and I got my counselor there. And she, she looks at, through all my transcripts, and I've changed my major. And, and she, she goes, you know what, Wes, I'm so sorry you have all this science that we just can't put anywhere. I'm so sorry you've got about, well, gosh, you've got about 30 unit credits that we just got nowhere to put. God taps me on the shoulder and says, remember, you didn't need that anyway. Sometimes when you ask God for wisdom, it's not going to make sense to you at the time. When he tells you to step out in faith, when he tells you to do something, it may not make sense. But I'm convinced absolutely that God does that. He'll test you and me to see if we'll just obey. Does that make sense to you guys? Are we still friends? Some of you think I need to be on medication right now, huh? But no, seriously. So we move on here. It says, let him ask in faith or he'll receive nothing from the Lord. Go Go to verse 21 here. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save our souls. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. So in verse 22 of chapter 1, he, he, he's, he's saying this is what faith is, guys. That, 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 that when you encounter various trials, hang in there, learn something. When you ask for wisdom, it's coming. So don't just listen on Sunday mornings, but be doers. Apply that word. How do I do that? Be doers of the word and not hearers only. How do I do that? You know what? The only way I found to do it is I bask in his word. What do you mean bask in his word? What are you talking about? Listen. Have you guys ever taken these incredible scriptures of God like, I've been saved, past tense, by grace through faith, not of works that anyone should boast. I have been saved by grace through faith. And that not of myself, it's a gift of God. Not of works that I should boast. I have been to as many as received him. I've received you, Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. Basking in his word changes you. The problem is on Sunday mornings, we come in here with this very Western mentality of I'm just going to grab some information and go maybe apply it to my life rather than letting God's word saturate us. Because it's living. It's his living word that saturates us. And I tell you what, whenever I get, and I've vacillated back and forth through the years, the intellectual versus the, versus the real spiritual thing. And, and, you know, I like to talk intellectual talk when it comes to the Bible, you know, the, the, these things on the different doctrines. But after a while, it's exhausting. I, I would rather spend that time praying I would rather spend that time just seeking the Lord and worshiping rather than getting into some of these silly doctrinal arguments that the church gets involved in. Be doers of the word. Now, let me make this statement before we move to chapter 2. Faith is the process of believing what is already true. Faith is the process of believing what is already true. If God has said it, it's true. If he said it about me, it's true. <laughs> so chapter two, we, we go on and get an insight into what's going on in the people that James, to, in the church that James is writing. My brethren, do not hold faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord of glory with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention, verse 3, to the one wearing fine clothes and say to him, 
You sit here in the good place and say to the poor man, you stand here or sit at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Folks, what this church was doing that James is writing to about your faith is dead unless you're, you're acting out on it is when people were coming to the church, they would judge them by the things they're wearing or the chariot they drove up in. Hey, they have a new car. Hey, they got gold dripping from them. Hey, you sit in the good place. And the, and the poor guy comes in, he's like, sit at my foot. Listen, this is so immature. I mean, think of a church that would do that. You know, if at Calvary Chapel, we don't welcome the poor or someone from a crazy back, sinful background, and we treat only those people who seem on the outside to have money and all this kind of stuff, if we treat those two people differently, we might as well close the doors and put anathema across the head of the door here because we've just become a social club. And so what the, James is saying is don't do that. Don't show partiality. Jesus was from Nazareth. He was a carpenter. There was some scandal in his birth. So you don't treat people differently just because they may have money or not. Because in the end, what difference does a big bank account make? What difference does it make? You know, if you have money, praise God. I pray you use it for God's kingdom. I pray you use it for God's kingdom. Don't just leave it for your kids to fight over. So partiality. Look in verse 10. We get another insight into what's going on in the people that James is writing to. So he says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. So obviously they're going back to the law. They're going back to not grace, not true faith, but these laws, these rules. He says, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. In other words, you guys are guilty. You're barking up the wrong tree. And then finally in verse, look in verse 14. What does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? And then he gives these examples. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? This also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Now listen, here is what James is not saying. He is not saying that salvation does not come through faith. It does come through faith. But true faith, when it is birth, changes you. That's all he's saying, and that makes complete sense. Because we'll always act on what we believe in. It's a simple truth. We will act on what we truly, truly believe. Several years ago, um, we were driving on 47 out towards Hawk Point, towards our home, and Sharice was driving. Now, I usually drive, and I have no idea why I'm on one of those guys. you got to have control. But she was driving, and there was a wall cloud. Do you guys know what a wall cloud is? A full wall cloud, and it was emerald in color. Do you know what emerald means? It's either hail or it's going to birth a tornado. And this thing is like, looks like it's a half a mile away from us. And I turn to Sharice, I say, you, you, honey, you got to go. And we're about two miles from our turn to our, to our house. And it's coming towards us. And the people in front of us are slowing down. She says, honey, I can't go. Because I said, pass them. Honey, you got to go. He goes, she goes, what do you mean, honey, go? Now, men know what that means, right? What my wife, and I, honey, what do you mean? Go, 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 go. And it's coming towards us. And the wind's starting to swirl. So we get on Abishan, and we're going down our, our road, Abishan. Then the rain's horizontal. You guys know what horizontal rain means? It means you better take cover. And we're in there, and now the branches are coming off, and I'm still sitting there going, honey, go. Honey, you got to go. you got to go. you got to go. And she's going about 30 miles an hour in Abishan, which is a dirt road. And we get on a straightaway. I go, honey, you got to go now. you got to go. Honey, what do you mean? Before I knew it, my beautiful, tender, gracious wife was doing 50 miles an hour on a dirt road. Yeah! 
So we get up to the to our um, our garage, open the garage door. I say, get in there and get in and get downstairs now. Go, 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 go. So I get out of the driver's side, and right when I get out of the driver's side, it sounded like a rifle shot. Something hit our garage. Bam! And I, Kimmy was with us, our youngest daughter. I said, I said, in the in that side right now. Go, 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 go. So I go into the kitchen. I'm going, go, go. Come on, guys, come on. Kimmy comes running in. She has her books. I go downstairs. She throws her books down. I'm like, go, girl. And she goes downstairs. I'm like, Sharice, come on, come on, come on, come on. Share, 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 share. Come on. She comes in with a package and her coffee. Before she came in, I looked outside our little kitchen window, and the trees, I've never seen trees do this, were standing straight up and they were doing this. You see that? Lifting up. I'm going, go, 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 go. She comes in with a cough. She goes, oh, 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 oh. Now, question. Who believed their daddy that a tornado could be coming? By the way, a tornado hit a building in Hawk Point and wrapped its insulation all around our house. So that tornado came right over. So Kimmy believed what daddy was saying, and she acted upon it. My wife, not so much. <laughs> but we will believe, when we, we will act on what we believe. And, and this is the whole issue with faith, and we learned this last week. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And it makes total sense. Why, why wouldn't we believe what God says? This is something... <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting excited. Faith to me is becoming so much more reasonable and logical the older I get. I'm like, God said it. It's true. It's true. Why? It's totally logical for me to believe what God says. And so what he's saying here is our faith will affect our behavior. So if I see someone in need and I go, hey, God bless you. You're starving. You're a brother or sister in the Lord. God, you don't have clothes. Sorry. Be peace. Be joy. I'm going to go have my stew now. But God bless you, God. He said, what faith is that? And then watch what he says here. He says in um, verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works? That's controversial. When he offered Isaac his son on the altar. Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? Ah. And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called a friend of God. And you see that man is justified by works and not faith only. Ooh, what's he getting at? Verse 25, likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers, the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. Here's the point, and we're closing with this. Stay with me, five minutes and we're done is that the point is, if Abraham didn't believe God, he would not have offered up the most precious thing God gave him. If he didn't believe him, he wouldn't have acted. Simple as that. So what was most precious, when you read the account of Abraham, his precious, his, his promised son, his only son, which is a foreshadowing of the gospel, God said, I want you to give him back to me. I want you to give him back to me. And because he believed God, he acted on that. And the right James is saying, that's what faith is. That's what real faith is. It acts upon what you believe. Then Rahab, Rahab is a crazy story. Rahab was a prostitute in Jericho, yet she feared God. This is interesting to me. You know, you, you, can, still, you can still fear God and believe in God and, and, and yet have these things in your life that God's going to clean up, which he did eventually clean up. But, but here's Rahab who... Joshua is coming into the promised land. She's heard about Joshua. The Hebrew word for Joshua is, you know, Yahshua. And whose name is Yahshua? Jesus. So here's this type of Jesus bringing God's people in the promised land. And she says, I'm falling in with you. I believe. And she, listen, she put her life on the line. She risked her life for God's people. And here's what we close with. Three minutes, I'm done. May we be a church, may we be a congregation, and may all the congregations in Lincoln County, may we be Christians who are willing to give up what we love if God calls us to.
Because God knows. He knows if something's not good for us, and he may ask you to give that up. Maybe it's a habit, maybe it's a hobby, maybe it's a relationship. But if God speaks to your heart and you know it's not, are you willing to give up that Isaac in your life? Now, two things I've noticed, just an observation that God does with stuff like that. He'll either remove it completely from your life for your own good, or he'll remove it for a while. You get your sticky little hands off it, and then he'll bring it back to you for the right perspective, with the right perspective. Does that make sense to you guys? And then willing to die. Willing to die. I read something so incredibly encouraging. The women's um, soccer team, the national soccer team, is tearing it up at the World Cup. They are some awesome. You watch it. They're some awesome, incredible athletes. But an article came out that one of their, not one of their, they said their best defender was not in the World Cup because they were going to wear rainbow um, numbers on their their uh, jersey, LGBTQ. And she said, you know, I love the gay community. I love them, and this is not a response in hate, but the rainbow represents God's promise not to judge the earth with water again. And I can't stand and wear that misrepresenting what God has said. And then these articles started coming out, where's the best defender <laughs> for the women's soccer team, national soccer, where is she? And this article went through the whole thing and you got to the third sentence and it said, well, she's not there because she's homophobic. And I'm like going, can we just stop with the name calling? Can we just stop? Name calling works up to about third grade. She specifically said, I love them, but because of my conscience, I can't. And then she said, God's word does not change. It just doesn't change. And his promise was something precious in the Bible. And I, I can't go. Usually a society would celebrate that, and even those who are preaching tolerance would say, well, we should be tolerant of that view. Tolerance is the most intolerant doctrine ever taught because if you don't agree with me, you are out the back door. May we be a people who begin to think about this, that one day you might have to stand and face utter rejection by this society and this culture. You might face jail time. You're one of those Christians? You're one of those? I see the undertow of it happening. You guys know what I'm talking about? The undertow. I see it beginning to happen. But may we be like Abraham, and may we be like Rahab, willing to stand because of faith. Amen? The stamp word of prayer. Mm -hmm.